All right. Good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us. I'm going to start this panel by addressing you, the audience, first. We're going to do something different and make this interactive. So please, if you have questions, submit them through the app, and I'm going to take them throughout. Also, we have a polling question. If you could answer which part of the national security industrial base needs the most investment. And we'll get the conversation started and address your answer throughout. So we've heard a lot today uh, about China being the pacing threat for the Defense Department. I'm really interested from each of the panelists, does the current makeup of the industrial base actually, is it sufficient to meet this challenge, both with technological capabilities and workforce? Congressman, I'll start with you. Thank you. Yeah, listen, I think the component parts are absolutely there for us to have the capability and capacity necessary to counter the Chinese. But I think the issue is speed. Can we get what is there today in the hands of the warfighter in time for it to have relevance in relation to the threat that we face from China? I think we have to look at ways to do things differently. I think we have to look at how do we encourage those emerging technology companies, those startups, to take what is pretty exciting things that are going on there and get that into a scope that's applicable and usable for the military, do that in a shorter period of time. I think that we can do that. I think we have to, though, think with a sense of urgency. I think we have to do things at the speed of reality. Uh, listen, we understand that Pentagon's a great organization, but there are two speeds, the speed of the Pentagon and the speed of reality. Let's make sure that we're doing things with the speed of reality. And I believe, believe that we can do that. I, I'm, I really am enthused in the things that I hear and the things that I see with what's happening in the realm of technology. I know that our warfighters, our airmen, our sailors, our Marines, our soldiers, and for that matter, even our Coast Guardsmen, have the ability to solve those problems if we give them the tools necessary to really be successful in that realm. And make no mistake about it, no matter the threats that we face from China, we can counter those threats. We can give our members of the military that tactical superiority, that superiority to where they're not in a fair fight to make sure that we prevail. And remember, it's not just about prevailing in combat, but it's how do we have significant capability and capacity to deter adversaries like China? Because I argue the real strength of the United States military is to make anyone out there think, I don't want to engage them because I know what the outcome will be, and it will not be good for the adversary. General Brown, what are your thoughts? Um, I, I do think we have the capability and, and aspects of the capacity. Uh, but I agree with uh, Representative Whitman that uh, we do have to have a sense of urgency. As I came in as a chief, I wrote Accelerate, Change, or Lose, and I wrote that for a reason, because I thought there's areas that we need to move forward on. One of the key words I put in Accelerate, Change, or Lose is the word collaboration, because the Department of Defense cannot do this by ourself. Um, we've got to work very closely with the Congress. We've got to work very closely with industry to bring all these pieces together so we can all move with a sense of urgency. Um, we have done this before. Uh, our nation has come together in times of crisis to be able to provide capability. Um, I've watched us during the course of uh, the events in Ukraine, some things we've been able to move very fast on certain areas. What we want to do is not wait till there's a crisis to actually move at a pace with a sense of urgency. We've got to do some things crisis-like ahead of a crisis so we're better postured and prepared to, uh, to move forward. And keeping with that theme of lessons learned from Ukraine, what can you tell us um, that has been learned that will kind of just absolutely change how the Defense Department interacts with industry? Uh, I don't know if it's absolutely changed, because okay. what we'll do is we'll do it, and then we'll go back to our regularly scheduled program. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but I have seen areas where we can very, come very closely together with the industry and be creative. Mm -hmm. And one of the examples I've been sharing here recently is uh, uh, the harm missile, an anti-radiation missile I've flown with an F-16s, we've been able to put on a MiG-29. If someone had asked us before the Ukraine events to put a harm missile on a MiG-29, we would have talked ourselves out of it. Too hard to do, can't do that, too much policy. We were able to, in a crisis, to be able to figure out how to get things done. 
Um, so there are ways that we can work with industry and those that actually build the systems to figure out how do we get into the details to move forward in certain areas um, because of a, 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 a need in driving a sense of urgency. So there, I mean, that's one opportunity. Um, we've done other things like uh, low cost flood emitters uh, that we were building to put on our own ranges for our own training that we gave to the Ukrainians that they use to confuse the Russians. I mean, so there's opportunities like that, that and a number of opportunities that we were, were able to, to do that we've got to continue to work on uh, with our industry partners. Yeah, thanks, Lauren. Um, first of all, thanks. It's great to be here on this panel. Um, I think we need to start by debunking the myth that these technologies are only experimental, uh, that they're not proven, that they need to be tested. In my mind, um, these technologies, particularly when you think about AI as a tool for the department, these are global scale proven technologies that technology companies use each and every day. They're just not necessarily applied at scale for the department. And so when I think about things that the department can do to really encourage the innovation ecosystem and the broader defense industrial base to work on these very interesting yet challenging mission use cases for the department, I think there are at least three things, and there are probably many more, uh, that we could be doing. Um, the first, and importantly, I, I think the department needs a more modern approach to compliance. Um, the compliance of separation uh, creates cost slowdown and increases the overall timeline with which these uh, technologies can be deployed. So that's one. And I think we can use much greater software focus, software defined networks to ensure compliance that the department needs. The, the second thing is that we need to focus more on application rather than experimentation. It is true to say that these technologies have not been necessarily applied, and I think that's where we need to focus our time and energy, applying these technologies to use cases rather than getting stuck in the R&D pipeline around experimentation and, and believing that they are not necessarily applicable. And then the last thing, and uh, Secretary Shu and I were talking a little bit about this before we came on stage, I think there's an opportunity to think about modular systems and modular building rather than the large big bang theory of a program of record. At the end of the day, software is gonna power the department and the power, power the department's response, kinetic or non-kinetic response. And the idea of building modularly and integrating with the use of software, I think, is a very powerful concept. Yeah, I'd love to jump in into this dialogue. Mm -hmm. uh, so one of the key themes that we initiated last year, and this is something that DepSecDev and Vice Chairman strongly pushed for, is the Raider activity, which is the Rapid Defense Experimentation Reserve, okay? This is where we literally work hand in glove with the joint staff to understand what are the joint warfighting capability that they desire to have. Because in any conflict, we fight in a joint war and we fight with our coalition partners, right? We don't fight within a single service, okay? So literally what we've done is gone through three different sprints, okay? Each sprint focus on specific scenario, which um, some of the scenarios is not gonna surprise you where it's located in the Pacific, right? Okay, uh, so each one of these sprints, we look for ideas. Are there uh, items that's out there that's a prototype, TRL level four or five, that's good enough for us to experiment with at a, in a contested environment? So if it works in a lab, that's really great, but sometimes it doesn't quite work in a contested environment. So we're taking it to a contested environment to test things out, and then to, it's the joint staff in, in conjunction with the COCOMs and the services to say, hey, this proved utility. I'm working very closely with my partner, Dr. Bill LaPlante on ANS side. So how can we then rapidly fill this capability? It doesn't have to be a 100% solution, which takes a decade, right? But if it's a 70, 80% solution, it's good enough to solve 
a problem that we have within a joint war fighting concept. Let's push it out in terms of capability. <clears throat> so we're absolutely doing that as soon as we get an appropriation. Okay, so that's one thing we're <laughs> yeah, waiting yeah. on. Okay, yeah. <laughs> please give that to us. No, okay? no, no, no. We're, we're, we <laughs> okay. need to get it done. Okay, <laughs> but but that's exactly what we're doing on that side. And in terms of looking for innovative ideas, and I want to thank. Uh, Representative Calvert yes. for giving us $100 million of uh, AFIT money. This yes. is the accelerate the fielding and procurement of innovative technology. This is where we're looking mm -hmm. to small companies as well as non-traditionals. Do they have a solution to solve a problem that we have, right, that we can help them bridge the valley of death? Namely, they've already proved out this technology, exactly that you said, and the services, I love it, I want it. But usually, once you prove it out, they say, oh, I'm going to put it in the palm. Well, that's a two, two to three yeah. years later yeah. process, right? And then small c companies can't just sit there twiddling their thumb for two or three years until our contract gets in place, right? Until we get, get a budget. So literally, what we've done, we, we helped 10 companies to accelerate capability development, compress that by two years. So that's fantastic. And now with with Secretary of Defense uh, announcing the Office of Strategic Capital, mm -hmm. we will again help small companies to figure out if they need to ramp up in production to help them with the capital to ramp up production. So we're all for innovating and um, demonstrating critical capability that's needed and move at the speed of relevance. Yeah. Can I add one more thing? <laughs> of course. <laughs> one more thing that uh, I'm doing is I have roped in all the FFRDC and the UARCs to be the extension of my technical arm, right? I, work, I collaborate with them. I have quarterly uh, meetings with all the CEOs of FFRDCs. I have quarterly meetings with CEOs of UARCs, University Affiliated Research Center. I'm sorry for all the acronyms, okay? But literally what they're doing is helping me out and build uh, the technical underpinning of what we're um, uh, strategic strategically thrusting. We're developing physics-based modeling simulation that's tied into a campaign level modeling and simulation. So I know the outcome, if technology A versus B versus C versus D, which one makes a difference in the outcome of the mission? Then it tells me where to invest money in. We're standing up a highly classified war room will be inside a skiff, so I can lay out what is red cape doing, and then I'm able to lay out what we are doing. And then help me to steer investment strategy towards leap ahead technologies. So that's exactly the path I'm on. Okay. So, yeah. yeah, let me just uh, add in a little bit. I think uh, I'll just weave in several of the thought processes uh, because I think they're all relevant and absolutely right. Uh, the T7A trainer uh, that uh, we uh, have at Boeing, we went from computer screen to first flight in 36 months. Uh, this platform was delivered and developed with our partner in Sweden, Saab. Um, it's another piece of the example, I'm, I'm gonna just draw a little picture for you. Um, and it is, um, has, was built with using model-based engineering techniques, full-size determined assembly, um, and all kinds of other um, current generation and next generation capabilities that allow us to field uh, capability in an agile way uh, and support a really dynamic uh, environment that we're in. Um, this is just one example. There are many examples very similar to this uh, that we and, and our partners in industry have delivered recently. We need to do that like a thousand times. Um, we need to do that over and over and over again um, across uh, come from seabed to space on many different platforms. And uh, not only does that take us as the you know, defense industrial based companies working well within our own four walls, it requires partnerships. And we've already talked about this conference, the importance of our partners around the world, uh, leveraging that capability and capacity uh, from partners around the world. We have work in Australia uh, in progress and in other parts that uh, we all have to take advantage of. And then uh, the emergent, what I call the emergent defense tech uh, supply chain, uh, being able to work with them, and we have work going on there as well, uh, to be able to ingest uh, 
capabilities that they're de delivering on the commercial side um, and make dual use work even faster. Um, and there are examples of that as well. So if you think about this whole idea of seeing the partnership ecosystem, both uh, from a company, a traditional, emergent, uh, global perspective, and then working um, at an agile pace to deliver capability um, at a pace we've never done before, I think the whole system uh, has got to get uh, working toward that objective. And we have examples where we've done it already. We just need to do it more. One of the things I wanted to get after with that opening question was whether the relationship that the Defense Department has with not only existing contractors, prime contractors like Boeing, like Google, but also startups. So when we talk about innovation, that's often referencing these small companies that just have ideas. Um, they don't necessarily have the capital to really invest and scale them. So I'm wondering if the current state of that relationship is actually sustainable and how each of, from each of your respect, uh, respective um, podiums, how do you get after that? Well, I'll just state, uh, I was in Silicon Valley this past week and met with a number of companies and met with a number of uh, uh, venture capitalists. I, I do see that there's opportunity um, to, to do this. And I do see a coalescing of focus based on uh, current events and the interest in national security. But at the same time, what we've got to do is actually pick some winners and, and get some of these small companies to a point where we go, you know, they, they're, they're, they've shown that we've taken a small company to be able to go execute. And there's been examples of companies that have done things in the commercial, start small and move forward, you know, um, out, over time. Mm -hmm. Uh, like SpaceX and uh, NVIDIA and others that have done this. But we've got to actually look at some of the ones that are do doing capabilities today that we're going to need in the future and how we align and bring them forward. And sometimes it's going to take some uh, nurturing. We just can't use a natural system that they have. We actually got to do, you know, kind of hand walk. It's like hand walking a staff package through the Pentagon to make sure it gets done. We've got to actually do that aspect to, to walk it through. And then once we've done that, we build the, uh, a habit pattern of doing things a little bit differently. Um, and, and use it as an approach to, to move forward. Lauren, I, I, you know, I think it's fair to say that the speed with which um, the small incubation companies get to market with something that is commercially relevant and applicable to DOD has been too slow. But I would also say that since the instantiation of DIU, DIUX in 2015, 2016, if you look at the focus of the innovation ecosystem on the aerospace and defense community has been significant, the aerospace and defense market. In fact, recent numbers that were provided to me by my friend Ra Shaw would suggest to you that um, there's been no greater time than right now when the investment community, the VC community, has been investing in the innovation ecosystem in companies that are specifically focused on aerospace and defense. That's huge, and that is to Secretary Shu's point, we need to get that capital working for us. Mm -hmm. It is fair, however, to say that those companies have not been able to get to a scaled program inside the department. And that, I think General Brown is what you were referring to. How do we pick a few and then apply them? And this is where I think the idea of a modular concept is so important. Rather than trying to go to the big bang a program of record, we need to pick a few, get, put them in the hands of soldiers, sailor, airmen, the Marines yeah. to test them, to test them in contested environments and non-contested environments. Mm -hmm. The examples of what we learned in the Ukraine around how commercial con te technologies can really help in a contested environment, those same lessons can be applied today to the innovation ecosystem. And I think it's very much akin to what you're trying to do, um, yeah. Secretary you, Shu. You know, Karen, I, um, I spent six years as the Chief Information Officer for Boeing before uh, running our services business, now defense business, so I spent a lot of time in Silicon Valley. And um, the, the small startup, early stage companies are product companies. Uh, they work on the basis of processes that are about delivering product on a, a consistent, ongoing basis. Um, our industry is, is really designed around programs. Yes. 
And there is not a natural coming together of those two approaches, and we've got to figure out how to solve Fair that. Fair enough. And I think that um, companies like ours who understand uh, how to execute business development and contracting uh, with the Department of Defense and others um, have got to take a real strong you know, lead and, and pull through um, a lot of these capabilities. And today, it is, you know, you're right, the investment in defense tech from a VC perspective is significantly higher in general than general VC investment. So there is a lot of opportunity out there, it, and it's essentially a field of daisies right yes. now, uh, that if we don't get our arms around um, and get focused on, on the right things, uh, will not serve us well with regard to getting focused and taking advantage of bringing those what, what I consider to be a real great product capabilities into um, big industrial capabilities and programs that uh, can get fielded very quickly. Do you feel like you, I'm sorry, yeah. Lauren, I'm taking over the job. <laughs> but I'm, sorry, I just feel like there's a follow up there. Yeah. Is there something that needs to be done to incent a Boeing or the yeah. large OEMs to really pull through these smaller product companies and these? Tested, you know, yeah. sort of technologies that may not have a platform. Yeah, I, I think we we just I think if you think about the the agile myth, the methodology writ large, it is about bringing everyone to the table. And the way that this works really well is if we have a warfighter, um, a defense company, and an emerging you know tech company all together trying to solve a problem. And a big tech company. And a big it's, right. and so, a big t and a big tech company. <laughs> we can bring them along too, right? <laughs> so actually, one of the companies I visited in yeah. Silicon Valley actually had two of the primes. Yeah. Actually. It, we're working with this small company. And so the more we actually spend time together, yeah. we can quit talking past each other and start right. talking to each other and get in the same room to move things forward. And I think that's the real value of uh, you know, building relationships. And for all of us that are here, particularly at this panel, that have an interest in this particular topic, the more time we spend together, the more we'll be able to move this, move this forward and figure out where the friction points are. I, I think there are three things that have to happen in order to get startups and emerging technology companies to scale in the realm of the national defense business sphere. First of all is, for years, DIU played the role as the mentor. So if you're a small startup company, they were out there kind of looking around saying, hey, what's out there? Who's doing what? And they were the mentor. So they said, hey, are you interested in being able to take your technology and let's help you mold it to where you can get into the process in the Pentagon, whether it was an, an OTA or, or mid-tier acquisition, whatever the case may be, to help them along. It used to be that DIU operated right under the Secretary of Defense. So really, on, almost on a daily basis, the Secretary of Defense knew what was emerging in the, in the, in the small business sector there. What was the Department of Defense needing to be aware of in order to solve these problems? And also, how did we connect that with the warfighter? So I think DIU needs to be back under the Secretary of Defense. Second of all is, today as we speak, phase three companies are limited to no more than 50% VC uh, money. Now, if private capital is flowing to these companies, then the private capital folks are saying, hey, listen, this is where we think we're going to get a return on investment. Why wouldn't we as a nation want to say, let's follow that demand signal and make sure that we are following public dollars with the private dollars that are being invested there. That's kind of a signal. You know, we always talk about demand signal coming from DOD to the private sector. This is a private sector signal coming to DOD going, by the way, this is where we think an investment's gonna make a return. So what we ought to do is we ought to remove the 50% VC cap for phase three. And then thirdly is we have to be mindful too of how these small companies see what's going on and put it in perspective of what happens in China. Now, if these sorts of concepts start in China, you, you, you know how they start? This is exactly how, how they start. China starts with this, blank sheet of paper, and they just go to work. They say, okay, what, what's the problem? How do we solve it? How do we put together all the opportunities out there, out there? How do we put dollars in the right place? Now, for a small startup in DOD, <laughs> this, is, this is the flow chart. This is seriously, this is, this is the acquisition flow chart. So think about it. If you're a small startup and you look at it and go, now, how do I navigate that? You know, no wonder the small startups and emerging technology companies are looking at it and go, man, I'm not interested in getting anywhere near that. And why are the Chinese outpacing us in the development of new technology and getting it in the hands of their war fighters? Because they start with this, 
and we start with this. We got, now listen, our, our, our start is never going to be this, but our start has got to be something that's a whole lot simpler than this. So I will say that uh, in terms of uh, starting out looking at Silicon Valley and, mm -hmm. and other innovative small company, DIU certainly was in the forefront, okay, in the 2015 time frame. As a function of time, what has happened now, every single service has opened up their door mm -hmm. to also look for innovative small company solutions to solve their problems. So now we have an innovation ecosystem. Mm -hmm. that I can tell you, um, in addition to what DIU is doing, uh, there's Army Rapid Capability and Critical Technology Office fund a small company to develop a piece of software. The company's here, actually. At the, uh, mm -hmm. But the software will be able to detect in cyber intrusion mm -hmm. right, into if somebody's tinkering with your engine, you'll be able to know that. So literally, so via Army's minimal investment, mm -hmm. they demonstrated the capability on Stryker, mm -hmm. right? Now they're deploying the software on airborne platforms as well. So what I don't want to happen is restrict to say innovation can only come out of one organization. Mm -hmm. It has to be an ecosystem and allow every single service to look for innovative solutions, mm -hmm. right? So that's the path that we're on, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we are uh, enhancing the availability of any of the services to search for solution as well as the special ops guys who work very closely with small companies to look for solutions. Um, so, uh, yeah, that is the acquisition pain points. <laughs> so one of the, <laughs> okay. I, will, okay. uh, I will emphasize one of the things. So I've had, I have had a sequence of, uh, of meetings, a round table discussion with small companies, CEOs of small company on a monthly basis. Mm -hmm. I heard their pain points. And what I ended up doing is creating a spreadsheet, because engineer, you create spreadsheets, right? <laughs> of all these pain points, I had pages of stuff, and I categorized it. And then I shared it with DevSecDev. Mm -hmm. I said, here's the pain points I have heard from small company in terms of dealing with the DOD. And she said, this is great. Let's go tackle this, right? And then she roped in acquisition sustainment, the CIO, the, the uh, SAPCO office, the special uh, uh, programs uh, office, uh, CDAO, INS, all the organizations, she said, let's look at how we can collectively tackle this problem. Because it isn't one organization that can solve everything. Mm -hmm. So under DepSec Desk, constant uh, pressure on all of us uh, to work these problems. She has monthly meetings with us, by the way, to make sure we're progressing on it. <laughs> and she literally defined, okay, uh, INS with uh, uh, CIO, your job is to simplify the security uh, aspect of it. Namely, why does it take a year to get a secret clearance, mm -hmm. right? Why does it take so long to get a facility clearance? So they're working on that aspect of it, okay? Um, ANS is working on uh, the workforce, innovation workforce. How do we sustain our workforce? And, and what I'm working on is bridging the valley of death, mm -hmm. which ties into what we're doing on strategic capital. We have a bunch of initiatives that we've laid out. We just presented to everybody through a DMAG. And things we need, need to do is simplify our acquisition, uh, simplify our contracting so we can award small companies much quicker right, rather than taking many, many months to go through contracting. So we're absolutely are trying to tackle a lot of these acquisition pain points. You're good. Okay. And by the way, you know, that, that chart, which is very interesting, thank you, Congressman. Yeah. Um, we're talking a lot about the small companies in, the, in Silicon Valley. You know, we have people that are experts and <laughs> that know how to, how to navigate that chart. And I would much rather them be working on innovating than navigating that chart. Right. So exactly. I think it's yep. not just a problem for them. It's, it's, uh, it's something we all need to work together yeah. on for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Secretary Schur, you mentioned the magic word, which is workforce. And according to our poll, um, our audience thinks that investment in the workforce um, is one of the areas that needs 
to that needs improvement. Can you talk more specifically um, about how you're addressing that, particularly in the STEM area, and then the rest of the panelists, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, certainly in my world, uh, I'm trying to attract top talent, right? One of the things that we have done is we created this uh, smart scholarship program. And the smart scholarship program, is I'm gonna pay for your undergraduate degree, right? If I pay four years of your degree in one of the 21 STEM fields of interest to the DOD, you spend four years working in one of our DOD labs afterward. Okay, if I pay for your PhD, maybe you have to spend a little bit more time, right? depending how long you finish your PhD, right? So, so literally, this is exactly what we're doing. And last year, we funded 482 smart scholars, right? And this year, we want to increase that again. So again, the STEM workforce that we build is going to benefit the DOD, okay? The other thing we did is we created STEM camps for junior high school students. Look. You know, I'm a geek, right? So I, can, I would have loved this as a junior high school student <laughs> to spend a week in a lab as a camp, right? So we did that for 1,200 junior high school students, 10 STEM camps. It was highly successful, and the kids loved it. Half the kids were uh, basically um, sons and daughters of our uh, active service members, right? This is a great way to innovate them to go into STEM. So we fund a lot of those activities to make sure we have a steady pipeline of STEM talent into the workforce. Having a strong workforce is incredibly important, right? There's absolutely no doubt about it. I will say one other thing that's painful for me, I'll be candid with you guys, you know, I have to attract top S&T talent but the salary in the government is going to be less than half of what you can pay at Google, mm -hmm. right? And yet you're expecting me to tr attract the, the highest caliber talent. So these caps, these are all the handcuffs that I have um, that's on my ankles and my, and my wrist, and you're asking me to hurry up and race and beat China. Just wanted to let you know this, <laughs> okay? We, we do hear that a lot, and I appreciate you saying that. We hear it a lot at Google, and I'm sure all of my colleagues at other technology companies would say the same thing. It's about compensation, compensation. And I would argue that, sure, it matters, mm -hmm. but that working on really, really hard problems is also of equal importance. Mm -hmm. And it's how you put mm -hmm. your talent to work on those, for, on those problems that matters even more. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, there was a seminal study in 2008, McKinsey did it, about the responsibility of leaders in creating an environment for innovation and ideation and the incubation of technology. And what it said that leaders can do beyond anything else, paying people, developing people, is creating a culture. Mm -hmm creating a culture that celebrates ideation and innovation and gives them opportunities immediately on day one of working mm -hmm. in that kind of environment. You know, Google is privileged to be a cloud native company. Mm -hmm. It's only 24 years old. And when I look at what the company has achieved in 24 years, it's pretty astounding. Mm -hmm. But I do think it's a credit to the culture that was created, you know, 24 years ago it was about taking risk and trying things rather than about failure. Mm -hmm. It was, it is about, I should say, it still is this way. It is about this idea of curiosity and not um, organizational boundaries, being curious, enabling people to work across the entity, across the organization. We have these 20% projects, which are amazing, where any Googler can say they want to work for 20% of their time on some interesting project and they can immediately be applied mm -hmm. to that hard problem. So I think that yes, roles matter, compensation matters. We are not naive to not believe that, but I think equally as important is the role in leadership and creating the right kind of environment for people to really flourish. And I, I think too that there's, I think too that there's, there's another, another dimension to this that we ought to be thinking about, and that is the value of practical knowledge in what happens in the military 
is something that is of great value on the private sector side. And the question is, is how do you always cross-pollinate that? So how do you encourage folks that have maybe had a military career to at some point go into the private sector? And how do you encourage folks in the private sector to look at it and go, well, maybe I have an opportunity in the military? And I think there are two ways to do that. First of all is to look at within the military and see if there can't be a more formalized exchange program. And there's a little bit of that within professional military education, but I would argue at a higher level to say, why don't we do a time of being able to have a military member uh, do a sabbatical to, to say, instead of going to school, which sometimes they're allowed to do, is to say, listen, I'm going to go and spend two years working at Google. So I can understand what happens in Google, what happens with that mindset, what happens in that culture, and then bring that back to the military to be able to do those things. Another element, too, is for the private sector to say, maybe there are additional things that we ought to do to encourage our employees to become members of the reserve, of the Air Force Reserve, the Army Reserve, and make sure that there's a formalized program there where the company says, hey, listen, we want to make sure each year our goal is to have X number of our employees sign up and become members of the reserve. And think about that. The reserve would be in perfect position to put them into a cybersecurity role, to put them into an intelligence role where they could use even more effectively their experience in the private sector in what they need in the military and that it's informed on what is happening in the real world. I think if you do more of that, I think there's a great opportunity there that is somewhat unrealized in what can happen in workforce and looking at how do we do more in a formalized way with an exchange between the military and especially the tech sector. So uh, let me uh, jump right on that one since uh, yes. this has been high on my list. <laughs> yes. Um, we do have education with industry, uh, but I've also talked about education with DOD. Mm -hmm. And so I've been able to work very closely with Google to uh, identify three people that are gonna come work with the Department of the Air Force. Um, but I've given them uh, a bit of criteria. Like we gotta make sure we put them in a, a meaningful place. So they don't crush their spirit. Yeah. You know, they, they have to work that uh, work that chart you showed. Uh, but that, you know, short periods of time where they can come in, learn a bit more about DoD. And the key part, if you bring them in young enough, they build a relationship with some of our young officers and NCOs, and they continue to grow up, and they'll, they'll be us one day, yeah. and they're able to help break the, the culture. So that's that's one aspect that we're trying to get done, and we're looking to broaden that with other other companies as well. Um, the other thing I'm also looking at is when we do put send our our, uh, our talent to education with industry, how we bring them back into the force. Yeah. Because what we'll do is, uh, you know, sometimes that's considered a good deal, and so their you know their uh, functional um, manager will come back and say, well, now it's time for a bad deal. No, we actually got to take advantage of that good deal they had and put them in the right job when they come back into uh, back into the Pentagon or whatever part of the Air Force. Uh, and those are the areas that I'm focused on. The last thing I, that I'm also trying to do is actually have some non-traditional career paths yeah. within, the, within our Air Force. It's for those that actually have these special skills, love what they're doing, and if I can leave them where they are, um, continue to promote them and, and allow them to move forward. And to your last point, I had a chance with uh, DIU this week, and they uh, showed, uh, shared a program with me called Gig Eagle. Mm -hmm. And it's the same kind of thing where you have a reservist uh, that has a skill set but how do we, where we place them within the Air Force because of their civilian uh, background and how they can connect with industry. But your, I mean, your point's another great, great one to have uh, those that are out in the uh, uh, private sector to come join the reserves. Yeah. yeah. We're hiring. So we're, we're you know, <laughs> happy to have them as well. Yeah. So. Yeah. I want to pivot real fast to an, an audience question. Last year, the Congress created a commission on reforming the Pentagon's budget process. What potential reforms would you put on the table for that commission's consideration in order to accelerate innovation in these tough operational problems? So maybe I can sure. pipe in a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is the PPBE commission you're talking about, which thank, thank you guys for standing that up commission, okay? <laughs> We have all kinds of issues that we could need help on. Yes. Uh, I think in the race against China, we handcuff ourselves. Mm -hmm in terms of processes and rules and regulations, right? We have colors of money, in which, of course, you segment our, our DT&E, then we segment procurement, uh, then we segment operations and maintenance money. It's an arbitrary divide of money. Mm -hmm. That's one thing, okay? The other thing is we have this culture of user or loser, 
right? If you don't spend your money, by the end of the year, you're going to lose the budget. So uh, one of the things we have asked for, especially uh, in terms of funding university research, can we alleviate that? So work very closely with Comptroller, with OMB to, to, to change that process. So because the academic cycle is not necessarily fits well in within our pump, with our fiscal cycle, right? So there's a lot of these things that uh, we can help to change the processes to help us move faster. And uh, please don't give us CRs every year. <laughs> that could also help. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I guess one thing I would add just to that is um, there are things we could change, but I also believe there's, there's cases where we do have the authority to, to actually do things faster yeah. that we just don't have the habit pattern of doing. Yeah. And so what we've got to do is challenge ourselves in some cases to, to really figure out if we already have the authorities, yeah. you know, why aren't we using them before we start asking? I mean, we need to probably look at some more authorities and some different approaches, but there's some things that I think we do have that we... We have a habit pattern. We've done this a certain way all the time. We've got to break that habit pattern and, and take full advantage of all the, the tools we have to move faster in certain areas. I, I think that's a great point. What you see today is a structure that puts everything towards the concept of the requirement. So if you have a company that says, hey, I got a great idea, I can do it less expensively, and someone in the Pentagon goes, well, I'd love to do that, but guess what? I don't have a requirement to do that, so we're not going to do that. And there are other avenues, uh, OTAs, uh, other transaction authorities, uh, MTAs, middle tier uh, authorities. All those things are there, but the problem is, is they are the exception rather than the rule. Mm -hmm. So I think what we have to do is to reform the processes in the Pentagon to say all of these efforts, whether it's requirement driven, whether it's OTAs or MTAs, all exist on a level playing field. So if somebody comes in in a windshield, they look at it and go, there's equal access to all of these. Now, a lot of times they're told that. So someone says, well, there's not a requirement, but you can pursue an OTA. And if it's a new company, they go, well, well what's an OTA and how do I go about doing that? So we have to simplify the process so that folks know very easily, this is how I navigate it and this is how I can get in to make sure that I can do business in, in the Pentagon. I, I think that those things are incredibly important. And as we looked at the acquisition process there, the simpler that we can make it, the more basic it is to a connection between the capability that a company has and the capacity that they have, and the quicker we can get it. General Brown, as you said, the speed element of that is critical. How do we increase the speed? How do we simplify the process? If we do that, all of a sudden, the innovation and creation that we long for that needs to get there, that needs to get in the hands of the warfighter, gets there faster. And, and the closing element of that, too, is that as we bring those companies in, and it's been mentioned here before, but I don't think it can be overemphasized, and that is, as we're developing this technology, it needs to be a ground-up development. So it's great to have the, 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 the Joint Chiefs and others look at this and go, yeah, that would be a great, great opportunity for that technology to be applied, but it has to start with that Marine Lance Corporal, with that Army Private, with that third-class airman, with that third-class seaman, and work from there on up because let me tell you, those individuals are incredibly talented, incredibly insightful, and they know what will work. And they see it each and every day, and what we learn from them is invaluable. If we have a system that's from the bottom up and assures that what comes from there is what guides our technology, and we make it simpler for those companies that say, we got a great idea, have them start with folks there at the ground level and then have a quick and easy pathway for them to get there, we can do things at the speed of relevance, at the speed of reality. And Congressman, I think we have a great example um, of a place we could start. Obviously, necessity is born out of crisis, oftentimes, yeah. and with the war in Ukraine. Yes. Uh, many commercial companies, as well as commercial companies from within the defense industrial base, as well as defense itself, brought great technologies to bear mm -hmm. um, in Ukraine for the Ukrainian people. Um, Google brought its network its, um, to, to help secure networks across Ukraine. We brought um, Google Maps to help make sure we could help the humanitarian crisis in the Ukraine. 
we were able to, using our networks, protect from cyber attacks as well as to instantiate, no kidding, um, capabilities to ensure the safety of um, uh, credit, accredited news sources. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So these are, and, and I know that there are many other companies that are in this audience today that also did great things. Anderl, I know, did some wonderful things around drone technology. Um, in Ukraine, and I think this is a great example of where out of this crisis we were able to bring commercial technologies and apply them in the soldier, sailor, airman, marine on the ground, yes. to your point, used them and they, they worked. Mm -hmm. And so now how do we learn from that? Yes. Ellen Lord is on the PBB Commission, we were talking about this last night, how do we learn from those products and capabilities and technologies that worked in Ukraine and get them into yeah you know, the, the acquisition system faster. I don't, I don't, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not asking you that question, but I'm, I wonder what we can do around that. Yeah. Hey, Karen, I think your example is a good one. And at the risk of talking myself into a partnership with Google on the stage. <laughs> um, I'm all in, I'm all in. Um, if you think about what you just described and the capabilities that you all delivered in, to support Ukraine, uh, many of the d defense industrial based companies delivered capabilities as well that we won't talk about on the stage. Yes. But you know, if you think of, if you're the right hand, I'm in the left hand. I'm not sure I, the right hand knew what all the That's left right. hand was doing. Yeah. And how does the future operate uh, much more efficiently and, and with more agility, in that we actually know what the right and left hand are doing, and we recombine all those capabilities to to field, um, you know, things that really matter going forward. That's a so great question. Great just point. A, a good thought process for us all. Secretary Shu, you're. Your office stood up the Office of Strategic Capital this week, and I'm interested in combining a couple of questions from the audience and my own. How much is appropriated for this office, and how will it be different in terms of being able to solve some of the investment challenges in these emerging technology areas? Yeah, I would say we, our intention is not to become a gigantic fund, okay? Our intent uh, in terms of, uh, funding uh, folks, uh, it's very unlike Raider. Okay, Raider, we put a chunk of money in there uh, for the uh, for the experimentation. Okay, uh, the purpose of Office of Strategic Capital is really to work with uh, uh, our uh, investors in terms of uh, uh, the venture capital area. There's no need for us to duplicate a fund. Okay, so we're working with the venture capital folks to say, hey, there are some critical technologies that we wanna make sure that we as a nation keep so there's no adversary capital that's investing there and, and the product gets stolen, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so one piece is that. The other aspect of what we're trying to solve is, is working very closely and collaboratively with a small business association, we can then leverage um, the capability that already exists in, in terms of, uh, in, in terms of uh, leveraging um, funds or creating funds. I mean, right now, uh, SBA Small Business has over 300 funds that's available to help small companies, right? So we want to leverage that type of debt and equity that's available perhaps to also uh, provide a small company who needs to capitalize to get into production to help them to get some guaranteed loans. So these are some of the concepts we're exploring. But uh, the fund that we're asking for is for manpower to stand up the office. So it's a very small chunk of money to stand up the, uh, the, this office. Okay. Can you say how much? Uh, no. Yes, it's not uh, <laughs> not in the budget yet, that's right? Right. That's <laughs> so right. I can't tell you. <laughs> General Brown, I'm interested in any initial thoughts you have on how the Air Force might work with this office. I know the Air Force has F-Works where a lot of those uh, investments take place, but since this is new, what are your kind of off the cuff thoughts? Well, I see it as an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it was just announced, so it's not, uh, you know, uh, I've only read the, some of the press reports, they haven't had a brief uh, associated with it, but uh, some very uh, uh, nascent understanding of what the opportunity may uh, be. But the key point there is, is having capital to support these small companies and grow beyond, uh, you know, our, our the cybers that we already do, 
Uh, that also take up on what Rep. Whitman said, you know, if VC's putting money against it, don't put a cap against it. Yeah. And so look at opportunities of how we, you know, make sure that these small companies don't have to wait the typical two years to get into something, particularly if they have a capability we are highly interested in. Um, because it's not only the small company, but it's also to figure out how best to help it scale, particularly, you know, as we're going to bring it into the Air Force or within the department. Because that's another piece of this puzzle that we don't often talk about. Great technology, great idea, or are we going to be able to scale it? Um, and that's another aspect. Um, and I think this is where thinking through this um, is a one area. The, the last thing I'd hit, hit on is because I was, uh, as I was in Silicon Valley, and this was announced, uh, uh, some of the people I were talking to said, don't only focus on the software side of this, we need to focus on some of the hardware particularly as you think about semiconductors and AI. I learned a lot this past week on semiconductors and artificial intelligence, uh, more so than I had in the past. And we really got to think about the, the, all the things we need to do to bring the capability forward. And there are small companies doing this, but there's also large companies uh, that are doing this as well. But uh, you know, I'd build up on what Ted said. Left and a right hand, yeah. left and right foot. We all need to know what everybody's doing. And that's the challenge, whether it's um, between companies or levels of classification as well. And that's another, I think, another challenge we have uh, that we've got to work through as well. Uh, and I think the Office of Strategic Capital needs to be complementary to the Defense Innovation Unit. Mm -hmm. So, and, and AFIT, I think, has had a good first start. I think the 100 million that was there it was a good first start. The question is, is how do we make sure as we are allocating dollars there that we indeed get the dollars to the amount that makes sure that these companies can take that leap to scalability. And listen, I understand with the, the 100 million and split amongst 10, 10 companies, as I've talked to them, some of them have said, hey, listen, we could maybe get there a little bit faster if we had some more. So from our standpoint, what we have to look at is how do we enable AppFit? How do we make sure, too, that we elevate the function of DIU? How do we make sure, too, that the Office of Strategic Capital is working as a complement in that? Because now there are kind of all these moving parts out there. You have AppFit, DIU, and Office of Strategic Capital. So let's make sure that they're not conflicting with each other or not taking away from one effort to another. I look at them as complementary efforts, yeah. but we have to be very careful to make sure that they don't take away from other efforts, because if they do, what, that duplication is really going to make things difficult. Yeah, certainly not the intention to duplicate yeah. at all. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> right? yes. Yeah. It's really to help the small companies mm -hmm. in looking at multiple avenues that we have in terms of helping out yeah. small companies yeah. to scale up, mm -hmm. get into production, right? And in that same vein, I'm interested in the industry perspective there on how important this venture, cap venture capital investment is in actually scaling these capabilities. I, I mean, my, from my perspective, you know, seeding the innovation economy is good for everyone. And, um, and that is one of the, I think, strategic differentiators that we have as a country and as allies is that we, we have diversity to leverage. And if you don't see the diversity, you don't get the value out of it. Now, the trick is seeding it and then finding the pathway uh, to get to scale. And I do think that figuring out how we get the whole ecosystem working together, how we get these cogs in line with one another is, uh, is where success will, will come out. And you know, we are all obviously really keen to be a part of that. We won't be able to do everything ourselves. Um, we are 100, we're a hundred and some odd euro company. We do a lot of amazing things really, really well. Uh, but we also know there's a lot of things out there that we can do better and we can partner up with other, other players to do so. So um, we look forward to, to working with it all. I, I think Ted said it well. The only thing I would add to it is I think it should give us a lot of hope uh, that so many young entrepreneurs want to work in this space, in aerospace and defense. They are mission-driven, purpose-focused, and I think seeding you know, the, uh, in, the innovation economy, as Ted said, I think it will really rally even more young entrepreneurs to this space. Absolutely. Yeah. And we'll do a quick wrap up. Mm -hmm. So what, are you, what do you expect to see? We, we have the pacing threat, that's China. We have the ongoing war in Ukraine. We're talking about innovation. So what can we expect to see in terms of new emerging technologies, capabilities, partnerships, technology exchanges in the coming year? And you can just go down. I'll start with you, General Brown. 
Well, I, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to tell you what technology. I'll tell you what problems I have to solve. There you go. <laughs> and that's, I mean, that's really what I'm focused on as, a, as an operator and as a service chief is to provide operational problems so those that are working in technology can help us solve those problems. And this is why the collaboration is so important for us to spend time together to share the problem and then turn to uh, our, our, our partners in the industry, no matter how big or how small the company is, and then allow them to help us solve those problems. Yeah, I think uh, you know we're focused on some of the really big items we've talked about, things like uh, advanced autonomy, um, you know, next generation, really important materials, uh, artificial intelligence, great, great, great software needed in everything, um, and, um, and fixing the supply chain on the hardware side. I think all those capabilities will uh, create the building blocks for uh, the next generation of capabilities that even this emergent innovation economy in the defense tech world will be able to leverage. And I think those, all, that the entire ecosystem is really important to all of us. Well, two things. First of all, it sounds like I'm walking out of here with a strategic partnership agreement with Boeing. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll do that. The second, the second thing, and more importantly, obviously, is I think using AI to really power the digital transformation of the department. Yeah. And that's where we are you know, wholly focused. I want to add one more thing that I forgot to mention a little bit earlier. We are partnering with our allies and international partners. I see Australia sitting in the front as one of outstanding partnership we have with Australia. We created a classified construct in which we can share information. We are collaborating hand in fist to deliver capabilities that's going to be interoperable, born interoperable, right? And they are moving really, really fast. So we can deliver some of the capabilities a lot faster than just developing on our own, okay? So I want to thank my Australian partners right here, okay, to give them a shout out. But we're doing the same thing, looking across other ally partners, see what they have in terms of complement us, not to take away from our work, but to complement us and accelerate capability in the near term. Okay, a lot of stuff we're doing on classified, so I can't really, I don't want China to find out, so <laughs> I'm not gonna tell you about it, but we're, we're doing some really cool, innovative stuff. But, and, and the other point I wanna emphasize, the focus is you cannot say innovation only comes out of a uh, commercial company. There's a lot of innovation coming out of our defense industry as well. A lot of stuff are in the other world that you don't necessarily see the details, but there's a lot of innovation coming out of there as well because the capabilities, well, you just saw B-21 rolled out, right? Uh, there's other stuff that's in development that has significantly even more capabilities, right? And that's being enabled by our defense industry. So I don't wanna just say, hey, innovation only comes out of one sector. It is holistic. It is defense industry, commercial industry, our international partners and allies. Okay. Congressman closes out. Yeah, I, I think the single most important thing that we all need to keep in mind, and you heard this theme in common with everybody here on the stage about what is the path forward, is the way that we are going to prevail strategically is to make sure in the economically challenged environment we're going to face in years to come is how do we get more per our dollar than the Chinese get per their yuan or the Russians get per their ruble. And we've shown that we can do that. And we will win strategically when we are able to make sure we bring all the things we talk about with innovation and creation. And Congress needs to play a critical role there to make sure that we either take away impediments that may be there for the Pentagon or for the industry or add things that are tools for the industry or for the, for the Pentagon. Those things, I think, are incredibly important. How do we get the most out of those resources? As Secretary Xu said, our allies are going to be critical there. Australia, obviously, an incredibly important one, but there are many, many other ones out there. They bring a significant amount of resources to the table, as well as the leverage of private capital. Folks, that is the path forward, and we will prevail because we will do more per our unit of currency than anybody else in the world. We've done it before, 
and we will continue to do it, and that's how we will prevail strategically. I want to thank each of you for being here today, and thank you for joining us. That is our time.